Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. And our artist this week from Sandy's Finishing, Sandy Higgins. Welcome, Sandy. Hi there, Gary. Thank you for asking me. I've been a fan for a long time. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. No, looking forward to this one. Get to learn a little bit about uh, finishing here and needlepoint finishing, which um, since I'm a lover of the needlepoint, um, I got stuff to learn here. So it's going to be great. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Well, there are a lot of there are a lot of finishers out there. I'm not the only one in town or the expert. <laughs> well, you're you're but our I expert. Do my, I do my best. <laughs> you're our expert at the moment. So how's that? Okay, <laughs> okay. that's fine. That's fine. Plus, you you've done gay and stuff, so that makes you more expert than most. I'm saying. <laughs> done most of her hearts. Yeah. And uh, and some of the uh, jeweled crown pieces that she's done. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful work. She's a beautiful stitcher. Yeah, she's an excellent stitcher. Yeah. yeah, I have no doubt of that. No doubt. <laughs> Superb designer, but I have no doubt that the stitching is spot on on every front. Yeah. yeah. I remember many years ago, she was doing a book on uh, Northwest uh, Designs, and she had done a huge wall hanging. I had to block it. And I don't think it was off an eighth of an inch, the whole thing. <laughs> you know, that six by 40 something. It was just huge. It was, it was how big? It was over 36 by 48, I'm sure. Holy smokes. Yeah. And it wasn't more and than an eighth she, of an inch off? Wow. I don't think, I don't think so. No. That's something, you know, that bringing that up, that's something that is is one of my <laughs> sticking points. Is I I really hate finishing a needlepoint piece. I mean, cross stitch and other things on linen, you know, that's easily squared up. No big deal. That's just patience. But needlepoint canvas, I really it's it's just one of my things. I hate finishing a needlepoint canvas. And then having it be out of square. And uh, I was just I was just dealing with that the other day. Well, we I, we did a whole thing on it, where I got some canvas that itself was out of square, and I have a piece right now that I'm I'm actually going to block uh, and square it up before I stitch on it because it it drives me nuts. Does, is that am I just being crazy? Uh... You know, I never thought of it until I listened to you on that podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I'm nuts. I, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's uh, how you feel about it. I never thought uh, to ever check the canvas to see if it was square or not. I just tack it down and crank it out as hard, you know, as tight as I can and stitch away. And I would say, Almost everything needs blocking. When you make a garment at the end, you need to press the hem and tidy everything up. Um, so that's why I do. There are some ornaments that I get that are small enough and the stitcher is so perfect that they almost, they don't need blocking. But anything bigger, uh, pillows, etc. Uh, oh has to be blocked okay so i'm so i'm i'm really kind of out on the outer edge then in, in thinking about that yeah but if you don't want anybody messing with your work after you're finished with it i don't i th think it's a good idea to do what you do hmm. yeah sometimes i just obsess over things like that and and i should i think i should really just dial it back and and, and move on but uh, uh, well, yeah. it was it was the the Debbie Rowley piece where I got that center done and and it, it it just was not square. It was visually not square. And then when I looked at the canvas, I mean, it was off by quite a bit. And I I just thought, you know, that's just going to drive me nuts. Um, but then you know, like I said in that show, other canvases weren't square either. And um, so maybe I you know, and I've had many needlepoint people say to me since then, you know, I just, just don't worry about it. Just stitch and get done with it. And yeah, 
Um, well, I'm going to go test a few pieces of canvas. <laughs> and see if they're on it. it. It perks my uh, curiosity. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, and I, I like I bought blocking uh some a blocking board it's actually i think it's really thick foam i haven't actually used it uh like puzzle pieces that go together and but i'm also hesitant to block the canvas because you have to obviously you have to get it wet because the one that that i blocked uh or squared up as much as it is for debbie's piece it softened the canvas and uh so that's changed the stitching experience for me in that I have to be careful how tight I pull that because the, um, you know, the canvas threads are not as stiff as I'm used to. So, you know, because, yeah, I mean, I weaken the sizing. Um, but I think I over, I know I over wet it when I was doing it. You know, that was my fault. Um, so when I go to block this other piece, I'm going to be more careful. But, um, you know, I like to be able to yank on that needlework, that, that, Needlepoint canvas pretty good uh, when I'm stitching, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you go to block, you get a spray bottle and just spritz the canvas and lightly spritz your needlework and then pull like mad when you pin it down and get your angle ruler there to make sure it's square. Mm -hmm. What kind of pins are you, what kind of pins are you using? Uh there's, they're just pins that came with it. A T, they T, have a T shape on the top. Um, oh, okay. You really need a, a thumbtack, or I have push pins that are stainless steel. Oh. And uh, I, my husband made my blocking boards. They're made of pine, and he made them, oh, thirty-six by fifty something. And uh, so I can get several pieces done at a time. Mm -hmm. And we, we just start with the L square and pull on the edge and take off the tape that's on the edge. Yeah. You know, and then pin it out and square it up. And as it dries, the canvas will re-stiffen. And as it dries, if the needlework still ripples a little, that means you have not pulled the canvas enough. Oh, okay. So so what, so what we do is we go back and readjust the pins and pin some more and maybe spritz it a little more and then let it uh, sit till it dries. So it's really more muscle than water. Oh, yeah, lots of muscle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, sh you should see my daughter when she must. She, she gets her foot up on the edge of the table and pulls. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my. <laughs> But, you know, we see all sorts of, of, of stitching, uh, nothing like you and me probably or who are fairly decent or decent stitchers. But there are those people that uh, just go anywhere with their stitches. Yeah. And, uh, and if you get a geometric, uh, the different uh, segments will pull against each other. It depends on the threads. Krynik's really hard to block out. It's very stiff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's probably not much give in that. Yeah. No, no, there isn't. Yeah. So you're the other thing. I was going to say the other thing you have to be careful in blocking is make sure that their threads are um, dye proof, mm -hmm. and so they won't run. There's nothing more upsetting for me than to come back an hour later to check the work and see the dye running Ooh. into the canvas, into the surrounding threads. Uh, there's not much you can do really. Oh yeah. That's got to make your heart just stop. Yeah. Oh, so the, the customer should tell the, the finisher or the intermediary. I used, you know, an over dyed thread and it's not color fast. Please don't use water on this. All right. In that instance, then what do you do? Uh, I would use a steam iron, but not put it directly on the needlework itself. Uh, you can soften the canvas. You could spritz the canvas itself with water and pull. You may have to block twice then to get it into shape. But we do, you know, if it's wool, you can wash things. Yeah. We've taken old needlework and washed it. So for you, it's it's a wooden board. 
and push pins, stainless steel push pins. And, yeah, and I cover the board with ging- I cover the board with a gingham fabric. That's interesting to know. Well, that helps me. Well, I mean, because I I am going to do this this canvas that uh, I have for the next project. I'm going to do it before I do any stitching. So um, that should be a little easier, I would think. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to hear how it comes out. So would I. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will. I will. Well, I just, uh, that's just the way I am. And and I think it comes from the first needlepoint piece I ever did um, was wool and tent stitch. But I was not taught to do basket weave. And so I just merrily stitched along. Oh, I had it on a scroll frame. Just merrily stitched along, just doing tent stitch. Just, you know, happy-go-lucky. And when I took it off that frame, boy, it just, <laughs> it, it just, was askew, yes. oh, it was more than a skew. <laughs> well, it, that's how I started. Yeah. Uh, half cross on half cross, fill in the uh, background with the center all done. And uh, wool thread. That's all we had. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I remember those. You could buy the center all done and then you just filled in the background. I never understood that. Right. <laughs> Well, that's what came out of Europe and came to, you know, that's what we had in this country back when I was a little girl. Uh-huh. And even even when I started uh, up again in the 60s to stitch, uh, there weren't that many painted canvases or threads. Mostly we had pattern in yarn. Yeah. See, I started, that would have been for me in the early 70s, actually mid-70s. So and and all I knew then was yarn, but uh, there were some painted canvases, um, and you know I did mostly dimensions kits, um, which were were another experience. But it was it was all wool, and um, uh, but yeah that that first one I did when it went all askew, and, all right there's got to be a better way. We can't be having that because I mean I could yeah. just tell that there was no way that was going back to square. I didn't it didn't matter what you did with it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, but yeah, I, I remember seeing those, those uh, where somebody did the design. And all I could think was, wait, they did all the fun part. <laughs> 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 that's not fair. You know, why would I pay for somebody to do the fun part? Uh, and then I got to do the, what I, I always thought that was just drudgery, just doing the back. Cause you usually, it was, that was just tent stitch or basket, basket weave is, uh, just fill it in and um right you know it's like that's just boring <laughs> yeah that's the way it was back then yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah we don't don't do much don't see much uh, uh wool other than for cruel don't see that right. much there anymore. Are, yeah there are some com- companies i don't work with it very much so i'm not up on all those threads yeah when i um the wool like we're used to like a tapestry wool there are other wools uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head but they're finer Bellalusa I think that's wool yeah but they're real fine yeah yeah those those basically in this day and age in comparison coarse pretty coarse wools that we used to use and um, yeah it's what we had and it's what was done so it's okay yeah. Uh, it was, it, you know, but there's st- lots of people still doing cruel, and they need the wool for that. <laughs> right, right. But that's a much more refined wool thread, though, right? Well, the Appleton wool. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you could always split the uh, pattern and down into th- there were three threads. You could break it down and mm-hmm. make it thinner. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've only done one cruel piece, and uh, that was a while ago. So not not right up on my on the yeah. wolves of the day. Yeah. I'm not either. Yeah. So how did how did you get started? Were you a little girl? Well, you, obviously, you, know, you mentioned that a little girl when you started. What what was your uh, first exposure to needlework? Uh, my mother was a beautiful seamstress. Uh, I remember her teaching me needlework. The uh, working on the uh, half cross, 
mm-hmm. and the fill in the background. Uh, but I, more than doing the one piece, I don't remember doing any anything else. And she did teach me to sew. I made a lot of clothing, and my in-laws gave me a sewing machine for wedding present. So I made most of my clothes, and then when we started having children, I made their clothes. And I took several tailoring courses, so I learned to tailor. Oh. Uh, taught myself how to knit. Can't crochet, and I can't macrame. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, there's no, there's no particular loss there. <laughs> um, so I don't know when I, then I started back into needlework and needlepoint, and I was a young mother with a passel of kids, and I couldn't afford finishing, and that's why I sent you the picture of the tennis racket cover, and I, we were playing, my husband and I played tennis, so. I wanted to make covers, and I figured out how to make a tennis racket cover <laughs> with a zipper and a gusset and everything. <laughs> and uh, that then my friend started her store. In fact, it was the Needle Nook of La Jolla. And it was the original owner that uh-huh. I made. She wanted me to make pillows, and I said, well, I know how to make cording. Well, I have a finisher that's not very supportive of me but she's glad to teach you so she showed me a basic pillow knife edge and then i got out my old sewing manual and that showed how to make some pillows and i just started from there it was trial and error and i guess i then i had to learn to find filler for the for the pillows they didn't have pillow forms back then she used kapok which is a fluffy fiber that comes off of a kapok tree. And I had to make my own forms. Oh. I get ba- I get bags of this stuff from some wholesaler here in San Diego. <laughs> and that went, that went the way of all things because polyester came in and they started making pillow forms. Yeah. So That's you had so when you started this though you you did have a leg up in that you you knew how to sew fabric together and make it into shapes and cut it and so on and so forth so you did have some weapons in your in your uh, little arsenal before you started at least right yeah I would say I was a a fairly decent seamstress mm-hmm. nothing great but um, yeah I knew how to make cording and how to join it on the bias. And making sure the nap was all going in the same direction. Um, and I learned how to stuff a pillow pretty well, not to make them dog eared. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of key, um, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I just kept refining my techniques. And most of the pillows I made were just knife edge. But then I had to make a box pillow. And that was really complicated. The first one took me six hours to make. Oh, my. And I thought, there's got to be an easier way to do this. <laughs> yeah, I would so think. <laughs> I, so I figured out a way to measure and mark and cut and sew. And from that on, then on, they've been working. And not too long ago, I asked my daughter if she still used that method. And she said, of course, mother. Because <laughs> she makes all the pillows now. Oh, okay. Okay. So were you were you learning back when you started with uh, with that shop? Boy, I think I've been to that shop a long time ago. I really, yeah, I think well, I have. Still, well, it's still there, and I've been around a, almost fifty years, so they've been around about the same amount of time. Uh, I I think I have. I think I wandered in there on a business trip one time a long time ago. Yeah, because when you said that, it rang a bell. Because I remember I had an extra day, and I remember spending it in La Jolla, uh, just driving around, seeing. I'm pretty sure I went in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you, so well, were you learning see, on? Uh, were you learning on customer uh, projects? Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I've never had an unhappy customer. I shouldn't say that. Nobody is ever never or perfect. But uh, the few things that people have not liked, I'd read. I've, rec- uh, you know, reconciled. Yeah. Um, but 
generally I did pretty well, I guess. That, <laughs> Somebody was looking over me. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's impressive because, I mean, there's, that's an extra level of pressure uh, when it's, you know, the shop's customer and you're going to finish it. Oh, you know, man, that would make yeah. me nervous. <laughs> no, every, every, uh. everything has to pass inspection before it goes out of the door. Yeah. You know, and I, I didn't have fabrics. Originally, I asked people to bring fabrics, and then I started stocking fabric. And now we must have over 50 different colors of velveteen and morays. Mm. And I started carrying silk lately. And I have another fabric called Protégé. Uh, it's very nice upholstery-type fabric for pillows. Yeah, I bet that's yeah. a I bet that's a real progression over time of uh bring your own fabric and I'll put it together to uh I don't know what I want, can you make something up and then you start shopping for fabrics and and I'm sure the the inventory just grows over time. Yeah, well then you buy 5 yard, 1 yard, 5 yards, 10, 15, you have to buy 25 yard bolt. So I have a room full of fabric. <laughs> and, and then I, I have boxes of uh, quilting fabric, uh, calicos. that cut, Some customers like those on their ornaments. And I've inherited a couple of stashes mm -hmm. uh, from uh, a deceased finisher's family. Gave me all of her things. And I have trims and ribbons, et cetera. Yeah. No. So, is it is it any more uh, people just you just get the the finished piece and maybe a suggestion for a color that goes on the back, and then you're left to it, or do you get pretty specific instructions from people? Well, the the all the needlework stores that I deal with have fabric samples of mine. Oh. So that so the customer can pick the fabric that they want and the colors. Uh, Sometimes they'll say, do what, let the finisher choose. And my daughter Margie, as I said, makes all the pillows now and the large stockings. And she will consult either by phone or email text with pictures with the customer. So they have an input on how it will be put together in the colors. Mm -hmm. So we, so how, we give a lot of personalized service. Yeah, yeah. So how does how does your business evolve? You start out working for the store, uh, doing a few, and, and does it quickly ramp up to a, a steady stream? Um, oh no, no. Uh, it kind of grew gradually. Uh, maybe one or two pillows a week, a uh, few a month, and uh, then the the store was fairly new also. So uh, as her business grew my business grew. I had to teach myself how to do ornaments, which wasn't too difficult. And when I was learning how to do or working on the pillows, I'd buy from a local upholsterer. And I asked her if she would teach me. She says, no, but you can stand and look at what I do. Watch me while I work. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had questions, she answered them. So that's mainly how I I evolved. And it just it kind of grew like Topsy, you know, and then my friends would hear, can you do this? Or another shop would become acquainted with my work. And so it, it just grew. And, it, you know, when I started out, there were maybe 12 needlepoint stores in San Diego, needlepoint cross-stitch stores mm -hmm. the, the, in, in the county. The only store in the whole San Diego County is the Needle Nook of La Jolla. That's the only um, one left, huh? The only one left, and it's one of the very high-end stores in the whole country. Yeah. There's, they have two stores. One, one side is all canvas. The other side is all threads. Oh, my. So, so it's like going into a candy store. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Uh, and I don't, I don't finish everything, you know, all styles and shapes. And I don't do leather work. I don't frame. I'm getting to the point where I personally don't want to do um, tote bags, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
well, but we do pil pillows and ornaments. I do eyeglass cases, do a lot of brick covers. Um, I've done tapestries. You asked me, uh, uh, mentioned what uh, the most unusual thing, and I couldn't think, and I think through old photograph albums. My husband does a lot of woodworking, and he's helped me make stands and that kind. He has made them for me. But we made Torah covers, and the Torahs are the scrolls that yeah. they have at the uh, temple. Mm -hmm. So we, I had two ladies wanted to make Torah covers, and these were big. They were probably 30, 30 inches by, I can't remember how much, but they wrapped around an oval top made out of wood. And then there were two holes in the top of the wooden piece to where the top of the Torah could spindle could come mm -hmm. through. So my husband made the top mm. and milled the wood for that. And then I lined the fabric pieces and we wrapped them around this and attached them to the, the oval wooden thing. And then the Torahs were kept inside. Yeah. So that that was one of the most unusual things that I've made. <laughs> Had to drag your husband into that one. Yep. <laughs> no, I don't drag. I ask. And oh. Sure, whatever you want. He charges me. <laughs> I have to pay. It's a business, Sandy. <laughs> yeah. Smart man. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So this. Uh, so th this. As this grows, then. Um, there must be a point where you say, all right, we're going to make this a business and this is pretty much going to be full time for me. Did that just kind of sneak up on you or did you sit down one day and say, let's, uh, there's enough business coming in. Let's pursue this. Uh, no, it just started like from the beginning. And my husband said, well, if you're going to do this, you have to make an accounting for it. And I had to go get a business license for San Diego and because I was stuffing pillows, I had to get a a bedding, B-E-D-D-I-N-G, bedding license from the state of California. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, oh, yeah. I, the, the little tags that are on your mattress, that's what that is. Oh, so you had, to, you had to go through that whole regulatory thing just because you're stuffing pillows. Right. Wow. And I pay, that's an expensive uh thing to have every two years that gets paid. The city uh, license isn't very much money. Um, but it just grew and I, I didn't have to make a business to live from. It's just been kind of pin money. As my husband says at the end of the year, when you do all, all the accounting, I make about $4 an hour. Uh, okay, there's and, there's and the people, reality. People, <laughs> yeah, and the people complain about the price of finishing pillows, but I think finishing pillows is much less expensive than framing. Yeah, yeah, isn't that 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 but just I, that yeah. that just sums it up right there? You know, do you have like we've all been asked? Do you ever sell your needle needlework? No, you can't afford it. And, and, yeah. uh, yeah, because the prices people pay four bucks an hour. Yeah. Uh, -huh. <laughs> yeah. and they don't, they, you know, it isn't just making the pillow. It's, uh, if like the needle look, I go pick up from there or sometimes one of their clerks, uh, lives near me. She'll bring it on my way ho on her way home from work. But I have the process of checking it in, and then I have to block it, and we make it. It's got the, all the, the fabrics and the stuffing. Um, then it's either mailing it back out to customers or taking it to the store. Um, yeah. All time. All time. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. I do have a couple ladies who help me with the ornaments now. I can't do it all. Yeah. And if I could. If I didn't have that kind of help, I would have to cut back quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I have, I have to. Of course, I pay them, uh, and they need to. They're not doing it as a living either. Both of them are doing it as supplemental income. Mm -hmm. But uh, and they like to do it, and they 
of course, they do a good job or I wouldn't employ them. Well, I don't employ them. They're contract workers. Right. Um, but because they don't work full time or anything and they work at their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, See, so you so you had you've gotten to the point because I think every small business gets to that point where it, it can grow, but I'm going to have to involve other people or I can, you know, stem it back and have it just be me. So you got to that point and decided then you've got your daughter involved and these other ladies to expand, even though they're contract workers, you've got to still make sure that the quality that comes out of it uh, matches what your standards are. So you had to go through that mental process of saying, all right, there's enough work here. I, I need to add people and, and go through that whole process. That's, um, I mean, that's a huge leap right there. Yeah, it is. And that's why I've, I've really kept myself small. I didn't want employees. There are a lot of big finishing houses and they have a, employ a lot of people uh, to do different finishing uh, techniques. Some of them specialize, I think. I know one of my ladies does one thing very well. And mm -hmm. so I, I funnel it all to her. And another one does mini socks very well. So I, you know, I do these things myself, but we, I parcel it out. Right, right. And, uh, we're not as busy this year. And then I used to travel at least three months of the year at various times. So I would be leaving the business and um, coming back and having to catch up. Yeah. So th this, this year has been kind of nice to <laughs> be home and... Uh, not have to be always scrambling to, to get ready to leave or catch up when I get home. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I, I travel uh, quite a bit for my uh, regular job. Uh, you know, probably, oh, certainly a, a trip a month. Um, and I know that feeling of uh, either work while you're going or in your case, you probably can't do that. But for me, it's work while you're traveling or scramble ahead of time or scramble afterwards. But yeah, I know that feeling. And um, chunks of time come out of it. And this year I haven't had to travel at all. Matter of fact, uh, this week there's a, a trade show I would normally have to travel to. And I'm just going to sit at my chair at my desk and um, just watch it. And it's really yeah. nice. It's really nice. <laughs> it is. Actually, when we travel, we have timeshare. And when we travel like to Arizona or Oregon, something like that, or Northern California, I take my work with me. Mm-hmm pack up all the finishing items and take the sewing machine and off we go. And when we got where we were going, staying, I would work a couple hours every day. Yeah. Yeah. Just to keep, just to keep it going. Yeah. To keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. But I love it. Well, I, I, I think I there's, agree. there, that's the thing right there. Uh, when you talked about $4 an hour and the ladies that, that do contract work for you, they enjoy doing it. You know that really is is at the very core of it. You have you have to enjoy this kind of work and enjoy finishing these pieces, or or I don't think any sane person would do them. No, <laughs> and my husband said if I didn't do this, I'd be off volunteering for something else. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Or I'd stitch for myself. Well, now there's a crazy idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I've. A couple of years ago, I decided I wasn't going to work in the evening anymore. So I usually try and stitch for an hour or so mm -hmm. after dinner for myself. Yeah. You know? So now is is this these days, this is something where you get up in the morning, have breakfast and start a work day of finishing. Is that where you're at? Right. Yeah. 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 And sometimes I take time off to clean or cook. <laughs> <laughs> Our daughter has done all our grocery shopping for us during COVID. So we've been very fortunate that not having to go into stores. Yeah. I miss, I miss, I miss going to a fabric store. Well, you sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there gotta be a lot of inspiration comes out of those kinds of trips. Yeah. Well, when you need to look for something and you can't get there to do it. Right. And I'm not a good, good online shopper. Yeah. So. Yeah. So how does your daughter get involved? Does she uh, learn to stitch when she was young and uh, kept going? I mean, that's 
so many people, their kids have no interest in, in what they do. How does she get involved in this? Well, as a teenager, she learned about her sewing. And actually, she took a class from Gay Ann uh, when Margie was 16. She took a class from Gay Ann at the Needle Nook and, um, you know, on embroidery. And Margie is a very good embroiderer, and she's a good stitcher. Um, and she, she needed an income, and she was interested in helping me. And she started sewing on – I had a little tiny travel sewing machine, and so she would – work on that. Uh, at that point, I think she was living out on her own, and so she'd come home and do the, the work. Then she had to move back in for a while, so she was really motivated to work. And she's just, <laughs> you know, over the years, and then she got married. Her living room is her sewing room. Oh, my. So over the years, <laughs> she's done more and more, and it's gotten so she does the pillows and the big stockings, and uh, she's done some wall hangings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she's taken over that and she's done a lot of the ordering, helped me with that. Um, she's been my right hand. I couldn't do it with that. Yeah, that, that was the sense. That was the sense I was getting is a is, uh, good thing she's along for the ride. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. keeps wanting me to do other things because... She, I won't be here forever. In other words, I won't be here forever. She's <laughs> looking for her own interest in in the future. Yeah, I'll have, you know. Well, that's got to that's got to be a comfort to know that what you've built um, is, you know, when we're all we're all getting older. But uh, you know, that, to know that what you built that that one of your children uh, wants to keep it going that's got to feel really good. Yeah. It is. It, it is a good feeling. I'm glad I have her around. Yeah. And she's trying to train somebody else to help with the pillows because she would want to have somebody else help her if I wasn't around. Right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. That's great. So that yeah. the business keeps keeps going. That's fantastic. Keeps going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you're. But, so you're. She does uh, stockings and pillows. And you have someone who uh, focuses on mini stockings. And so ornaments is kind of your thing? The ornaments and the mini socks, uh, as I say, eyeglass cases, brick covers, uh, bell pulls. Don't get many of those anymore. Um, and we do straight just blocking for people if they want to take it to a framer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, scissor cases. I do some linen and cross stitch uh, if it comes my way. Uh, trying to think, a couple of the unusual things I've done. Oh, we do ta Margie does talus bags. Oh. And uh, I do the yarmulkes, and I've made some of the prayer shawls or attached needlework to an existing prayer shawl. Uh huh. Well, that's I, uh, a, that's an interest yeah. that's an interesting world, of uh, particularly for the Jewish re, uh, faith, the uh, the various things because those um, uh, those items have special long term significance uh, for the family. So that's got to be uh, I don't know heartwarming, fun, enjoyable to be able to create those things for people. Yeah, they're heirlooms. They become yes. heirlooms in their families. Yeah, I'd done pyramids for a church uh, in I think it was in Los Angeles. Uh, inserted the needlework into the damask so they could hang from the all, not the altar, the lectern, mm -hmm. the pulpit. And uh, I've done kneelers for several churches, quite a few. Or pillows for uh, there was one church that wanted pillows. I suppose they were they were hard wooden benches, so they had something soft to lean against. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. that's that's the pillows I, in a church. That seems like just ongoing hassle. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I've made a lot of three dimensional animals. Uh -huh. uh, I think I sent you a picture of a bear, a little bear. Yes. Uh, 
I worked with that designer. Oh, I met her when I first started finishing. She lived in La Jolla, and she was a professor of something at San Diego State, and she got into stitching, and then she thought, I can do better than what's on the wall in the needlepoint store. So she started designing and had a really terrific business. Um, unfortunately, she passed away several years ago, and somebody else bought the line, and uh, they sell most of her things now. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's Associated Talents bought her line. Oh, yeah, but they I don't think they sell the bears that was a bear with a pouch. So it was called a rue bear. And then she developed a, a rabbit. They call it a rabaroo. And then she <laughs> made then she made an elephant. But that didn't have a pouch. Oh, OK, but they were really cute animals. I loved making those. <laughs> yeah. And well, I've done uh, some of the tapestry fair and the T.S. animals, too. Uh huh. Those got to be fun because they're so different to do. They are. Yeah. Take a lot of time, but they're fun. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of fiddling with those things, without a doubt. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what? Let's let's give some people some tips. I mean, you wrote a book <clears throat> about finishing, um, which you know, that is is still available, still in print. That's been around for a while. Have you done how many versions of that? Have you done? <clears throat> Well, I've, uh, it was first started, I first printed it in 91, and I revised it on the third printing in 98, and then in 2010, I revised it, and Margie wrote a section on the talus bags, and I expanded, oh, I added standing boxed figures and a couple of other things. So it's, and then I, I keep reprinting it. Uh, the last printing was 2018, but no new revisions. Yeah. I'd love to do a major revision. It, I need to reprint soon because I'm down to 50 copies. <laughs> I do have, I have a distributor wholesale. It's Danji. Mm -hmm. And then uh, retail, uh, through Amazon at Needlecraft Cottage in San Diego, the book can be purchased retail. Yeah, and um, so what that that book will take anyone who is of the mind to do finishing, uh, step by step through a, a variety of different uh, finishes. Right, it's, I cover blocking, uh, all sorts of pillows, uh, I, ruffles, twisted cord trims, making cording. Uh, how to close the pillow, how to put a zipper in it. And on Christmas ornaments, they're hard and soft, uh, mounting on a ball or an egg shape. And then this large stockings um, and a box stocking, like a box pillow, but a box stocking. And that box piece could be sheared or gathered. Mm -hmm. uh, Miniature stockings, all sorts of, um, oh, and the other projects are the brick covers and eyeglass cases, bell pulls, oh, coasters. Oh, And yes. how to make, how, standing weighted figures, either soft stuffed or boxed. I have dollhouse rugs in there. I haven't made one of those in a long time. <laughs> Talus bags. And then I have a section on how to make chair ties and simple tassels and twisted cording, and how to make up to three or four color cords. Oh. Uh, it, it, it takes a couple pairs of hands, but it, it's <laughs> yeah, not too I'll difficult bet. to do. <laughs> That's fancy cords. And, <laughs> yeah. Then there's something called the binding stitch. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's an edge finishing, or you can join two pieces of needlework. And in the 70s, a lady named Joan Young wrote a small booklet about the binding stitch and how to do, use it. And it's kind of gone out of style, but recently um, I presented a program to our needlework chapter on how to do it because we were making the Ork box that Marilyn Owen had designed, mm -hmm. and she puts it together with the binding stitch. Yeah, yeah. 
So this so this is a book to have if you want to do finishing yeah. really of any kind, but particularly needlepoint. This is this is a really useful uh, book then. Yeah, and it relates to any kind of needlework. Yeah, cross stitch or cruel. I had a customer called me this morning and. She says, I have your book, and I sat down and read it, but I really think you ought to make the ornament. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if nothing else, it, it, it teaches the customer what is needed yeah. to take to the finisher, how you should prepare your needlework, and what you should think about when you go to stitch something, like getting colors that will match backing fabrics, um, Stitching with over dyed threads or not, letting the you know the finisher know. Yeah. T tying off your thread securely. Uh, if it's a pillow or a stocking, adding a couple of extra rows of stitching for the seam allowance. On hard ornaments, I don't like extra rows uh, because it's too bulky with a turn under. Uh huh. So, you know, all, it, there are all sorts of little hints in the book yeah. related to finishing. Yeah. Is, so when it comes to uh, things that uh, that cause you uh, difficulty when you're finishing, is I, I, I'm, I would imagine uh, threads that are not secured is kind of one of the top ones. Correct. And I hate to see all these and unstitched areas or lots of missed stitches. I usually turn them back into the, the store to have the customer finish, you know, stitch them. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it was Aunt Mary or was doing it where she had dementia, I, there was one piece like that. Why they just said, make it up the way it is. It was, it was hers. They wanted it as she did it. Oh, uh -huh. So, yeah. you know, but most people are grateful to have you say, oh, you've missed so many stitches. Mm -hmm. and they'd, be, they'd be glad to fill it in. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other things that that uh, people should watch out for if they want to make sure that, that what they send in will finish up pr properly? Oh, clean hands as you stitch. <laughs> and, 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 okay. and, and clean and clean needles especially on white you know you get mm. this uh, streaking and you wonder what happened it could be the needle it, it could be the oils in your hand if you haven't washed your hands before you stitch um, making making sure all the threads are anchored and, and let us know about the what do you call it the uh, over dyed threads? Yeah, over dyed threads. Those are the biggest problems, I uh -huh. think. Yeah, and work on a frame if you can, and make sure you know a lot of the stores will put about four or five tacks on a side when they mount up the, the canvas for you. But you really need to have tacks right next to each other practically. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I see that. I don't, I don't think people appreciate how many tacks you really need to have uh, to hold a piece of needlepoint on a on a stretcher bars or or anything. You really got to tack it down, yeah. And make sure your stretcher bars are straight. Uh, you can put them all together, but they could be askew. I put mine uh, into the corner of a. a a wall or against a door to make sure that they're at true right angles mm -hmm. or inside an L ruler corner. Um, and it, it's good to have a second person to help pull. Get a pair of pliers to uh, pull as you tack. I like. I personally like to staple. I don't like tacks. Hmm. But uh, having an extra pair of hands to pull when you're tacking makes a big bit of big difference so get all right so then uh, not only to get it tight but then uh make sure it's square so okay I'm, yeah i'm just looking for reasons that i'm not nuts so, <laughs> just... no 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 <laughs> and we all have our quirks <laughs> yeah i've got yeah that's just the tip of the iceberg trust me um <laughs> yeah hey we're here to have fun <laughs> that's right so do you uh 
like when when uh, thread ends come out, um, try to save them. I mean, you must get pretty good at doing that. Re-anchoring. Uh, I try to if, if, if I can. Um, I don't do a lot. If people will put away waste not way out in the corner, you know, out of the margin. We do zigzag needlework before we uh, cut it out. It might not hold everything. So make sure you weave those threads back in. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot. Of, and I don't usually add extra stitches back in. And it's only one or two. Uh -huh. um, but if there's a lot, I send it back or let them know. And do they want to you know, fill in the stitches. Yeah. Yeah. That takes a lot. It takes a lot of time to do that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a decision you have to make. Yeah. Is, is, uh, if this is just a little yeah. bit here and it'll take me a couple hours, that's one thing, but, uh, I'm not going to read, not going to redo the whole thing. You do it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, the other thing customers can do is think ahead, uh, how they're going to use the, um, item and are they going to make say a second pillow uh, buy enough fabric if they're purchasing the fabric for two pillows or let the finisher know that down the line that oh I'm going to have a number number two or three pillow uh, will you have enough fabric oh and will it change dye lots mm. you know, and buy enough trim. Uh, for the second pillow, say, if you're going to do something like that. Okay. Uh, well, that's, you know, so that's good to know. So I, I want two pillows sitting on my couch when I'm done. Here's the first one. Let's make sure that we can match it when I get the second one done, which could be a year from now. So, or five or yeah, ten. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, no, that's, that's a good, good thing to know. Yeah, think, think ahead on those things. I'm sure that you get all kinds of, of quality of stitching. Um, I'm sure you, you've seen the full spectrum. I, I remember one time I saw one in a store that had been turned into frame and all oh, the mess on the back was just, I just kind of stood there. I'm sure my jaw dropped to the floor. Like, how are you ever going to frame that and have it look straight? So, you know, when people say, oh, I don't worry about the back, but at some point, you do have to pay attention to what's going on in the back so you don't get big lumps and chunks. Oh, yes. Yeah, but not much I can do with it. Yeah. Yes, I, I use knots to anchor threads on the back of my work, but you have to make sure that – actually, I use a knot, and then I try and cut it off later after I've really anchored the thread. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually watching you, I've learned to do more pin stitches – and oh. use them more frequently. <laughs> that's a handy I little. Try. That's a little handy little thing to know, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, um, and people wonder, will those hold? Go ahead and try and pick one out. Good luck. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Or French knots, they don't pick out. <laughs> no. No, they don't. No, not very easily. No. <laughs> yeah. So what what are you seeing these days? More people have more time. I, I wish I was one of those people, more time to stitch. Are you seeing people do more painted canvas? Are you more ornaments? What, what are the, the trends you're seeing in terms of what's coming into you? Well, this year, because of COVID, everybody's dragging everything out of the closet of the drawers <laughs> and stitching. I can't believe it. Um, lots and lots of ornaments and lots of old canvases. They're stitching in for pillows i think a lot of people are having things framed mm -hmm. um but a lot of ornaments this year uh -huh. i had a wall hanging come back to me that she'd been working on for five or six years mm -hmm. and because of covid it came out of the, the closet you uh -huh. know, and she finished it <laughs> yeah um i don't see what uh bell poles anymore very rarely i used to do a lot of those mm -hmm. things come and go yeah that's always kind of been uh on my list out there in the distant because 
because there used to be a lot of bell poles, like you said, and I've always thought it would just be really neat to have one just because they're, they're such a unique piece of needlework and to hang them up and, and they just, uh, they've always just appealed to me and, um, you know, nice big long one all done up that yeah. you know, nice tassel on the end. Yeah. 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 A lot of them though, were the kind where you filled in the background and the design was pre-stitched. No. No, yeah, a lot of them were that way. Yeah, no, I don't know. I want to do the fun part. I'll pay yeah. somebody to do the background if they want to. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that well, that's OK. So ornaments, then uh, there's there's a real popularity with those. That's um, of course, that's fun. And, and you, you know, ornaments that can be used year round. I mean, people are really seeing when it comes to interior decorating. Uh, more options other than ornaments on a tree at Christmas time. Um, right. You know, when uh, you, Halloween yeah. is a big uh, holiday and uh, Thanksgiving. And now the patriotic, um, there's a couple of the designers have done patriotic sets with it. Like, uh, I think it's Danji. They have a, it looks like a gazebo. And for a town, and then all the little standing figures that go with it, mm -hmm. uh, like you were watching a parade or something. Yeah, uh huh. That's kind of the neat thing about ornaments. You can do that. Well, I mean, Gay Ann Rogers is an excellent example with all of her heart ornaments uh, of of all types for all occasions. And uh, there's so many others doing those kinds of things. And you know, buy a little tree and you change out the ornaments through the seasons. Or uh, many people. Uh, get a basket and just put a bunch of them in a basket and uh, right. put it on the table. Yeah, lots of options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Sandy, this has been fun. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. I hope I've helped added something to somebody's life. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you have. Finishing. I'm sure you have. Yeah. All right. So it's it's Sandy's finishing. Uh, you have a Facebook uh, page, and yeah, um, I don't post very often. Yeah. But there, there is one there, and then Sandy's finishing touches. Uh, was Google dot com. I'll, I'll put a link. Uh, there'll be a link on the page. It's a long, drawn out thing, but uh, yeah. you can you can see her work and um, uh, see the different kinds of things you do. And then uh, give us the title of the book that you the finishing book and what is that? It's called Sandy's Finishing Touches: A Step by Step Guide to Finishing Needlework. Okay. It's got a picture of my fireplace and a whole bunch of uh, finishing items in front of it. All right, and that uh, available through Amazon or uh, really any any store, any local needlework store can get it for them. A local needlework store can uh, contact Danji. Okay. Uh, company. They're located in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. Okay. All right, so people can get that book. And then read it right. and then have you finish their stuff anyway. Yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> uh, Be more than happy to. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks for uh, a little insight. That was fun. And All thank, right, thank you. It was. Yep. Thanks to everyone for listening.